Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be fixing the wiring of the 1967 Mustang by getting rid of most of it. So here we are again with the 1967 Mustang. Now I'm going to be installing an ECU Master PMU-16 into this car and for those of you who watched my 240Z video about converting to the PMU-16, you know what that entails. For those of you who aren't familiar, the PMU-16 is a power distribution unit that replaces all of the relays and fuses in your car. So basically it makes everything solid state and it makes it all programmable, which is really cool. Now this car had the fuse block relocated to the engine bay to make it easier to get to supposedly. I've never actually verified that that's why the owner did this. I don't even know if that was a good idea, why they did it, what they did. I don't know if it works. I know the accessories mostly work, so I haven't really dug too much into it. But I don't actually know where they even got the fuse block or how they wired it other than I've seen a lot of really poorly crimped connections. So my first order of business is to figure out how all this works so that I can get rid of that fuse block and put the PMU-16 in its place. Now this video is going to be shot run and gun style with this GoPro and I'm going to be basically just catching highlights so that I can keep this video as short as possible. Depending on what I find when I get under the hood, this could be anywhere from a two day project to a two week project. So let's just go ahead and see what we discover. In the engine bay here, we can see a lot of temporary wiring and not all of this is my fault. Now, this relay and wires back here, I pulled those up so we could see them. Those are the temporary EFI wiring I added to make the EFI have a clean source of power as well as the distributor and the ignition system because I couldn't just tie into those blocks because that's where the starter, the alternator, everything that's going to cause dirty power and big surges is tied into. You should never tie your EFI into something on the charging circuit like that because it's just a really dirty source of power. So instead what's happening is this main feed of zero gauge wire runs all the way back to the battery in the trunk and that's where the charger and all that stuff is happening. Then a smaller gauge wire, I think, believe it's a 10 or something, comes up here to feed just these systems, the EFI and the ignition. Now I didn't make a very clean and nice installation for that relay because I knew it was temporary and that's because of what the previous owner did. Now the previous owner cut all the wires and pulled the fuse block out from under the dash, ran a giant harness up here and put an aftermarket fuse block here in the engine bay. Now this was because he didn't want to have to keep crawling under the dash to replace fuses but I'm quite curious why he was having so many fuse problems that he needed to do all this work. Now, I could cut this off and put my PMU-16 in its place, and that would probably work. I could probably get power off of one of those big 10 gauge wires or whatever's coming into there and make everything more or less function. But I don't think I really want to put it in the engine bay. While the unit is environmentally sealed and it should be safe to put there, I don't want it getting so dirty and grimy over the years, and it doesn't do me any good there to be able to see the condition of the circuits. I can't see the LEDs on it or anything. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and probably delete this whole wiring extension, clean up all the terrible splicing under the dash, and put a plug under there, and that will let me make a new extension harness. So let's go look under the dash and see what we're starting with. Under the dash here, we can see a mess of wires. Now these wires were created by the previous owner when he separated this factory harness here to create this extension that runs into the engine bay. Now it's hard to see, but inside this mess is basically everything running the accessories and main wiring of the car. As you can imagine, ugly crimp connectors and melting electrical tape is not confidence inspiring for a main harness. So what I would like to do is cut this all loose and put a Deutsch connector on the wires that I actually need to preserve and then put my PMU somewhere like inside here and just make a new harness connecting the PMU to this existing body harness. I would then do a second Y branch off of that wire harness to go feed the EFI and ignition system. That would give me complete control of the wiring and know that there's no existing issues. So before I can do this, I need to find out what these wires actually do. 
So as a plot twist to the wiring process, we now have the fuse block pulled apart and I know even less than when I started. So this is a Ford branded and stamped fuse box, probably out of a junkyard car that's something newer than this, this particular Mustang. Now this box has fuses in it and looks like it should be doing the work to, as described by the previous owner, but it's not. After pulling the back panel open and testing all these wires, most of them were constantly hot. They were being fed by this constant battery line into the bottom of the box. Now I do know that the blinkers and hazards are actually going through here and that the blinkers are being fused on this gigantic 20 amp here in the center. But this stack here appears to do nothing. I tested all of these fuses. I played with every accessory on the car and it doesn't seem to do anything. With power disconnected from that block, all of the accessories still work. Pulling the fuses here, the accessories still work. So as near as I can tell, other than flashers and stuff, most of the accessories on this car are actually hardwired and not going through any fuse, which is kind of terrifying. And it's amazing that this thing hasn't burned up yet. So rather than following my nicely ordered plan of making a diagram based on this block, I'm just gonna rip this block out, cut it loose under the dash, get it all out of here and start testing wires one by one under the steering column until I figure out what they actually do. So after some quick hacking and slashing, all of this is out of the car. So in theory, without an entire fuse block in the car, you would think that the car wouldn't work. And you would be wrong. So obviously the EFI all runs because that's on a different circuit. But I still have headlights. Only things I don't have are my blinkers and hazards. I've still got windshield wipers. Yeah. Somebody uh, wired this thing very wrong. So as you can see here, I have everything torn apart. I'm probably about halfway through getting this all sorted out, but it's quite the mess with the bad wiring that was already in the car. So what I'm going to do is break this up into a couple phases. Phase one is just going to be getting the PMU in the car and getting all these main circuits that I can back to the PMU. So rather than watching all of this, I'm just gonna go ahead and magically teleport to when it's done. So inside the car, I have a bunch of the old wires labeled. It's mostly things to do with the brake lights, hazards, turn signals, all that stuff. I can't get to the stuff for the windshield wipers yet, so I'll just leave them working the way they've been working, and I'll deal with them in phase two when I tear everything apart a little more. I also pulled all the vintage air wiring back into the car and I unwrapped it and I'm working on figuring out a way to delete that relay. That relay is being used kind of strangely. You can see that it has jumping wires, jumping the hot side across that over to that switch or over to that plug rather. And that plug is jumpering it and then sending it back up the harness. So I just need to figure out for sure which of these are positive and negative and which ones are constant positive and which ones are switched positive by the relay and then I can go ahead and get that sorted out. This blue wire that comes back out of that relay actually goes to the trinary switch so I'm not entirely sure if this is being triggered by the trinary switch which is a multifunction switch that turns on and off your radiator fans. If this is a switched wire coming from there to turn on the relay or if this is going to the trinary switch to turn on the fans so i need to figure out exactly which way this this is oriented and know which one of these is which number because from right now i can't see so once i get this sorted out i'll cut that get that relay out of the line make the new wire a pmu controlled line so the pmu is basically the relay make sure i get an input that's working for it and then i'll get a harness starting to be made and put a plug on it for right back there i also got a eight gauge power feed wire brought in here and cut to the right length that's going to be going to the pmu so we're one step closer to being able to fire up the pmu 
Well, that all escalated quickly. So now the inside of the car is sort of a disaster area and I've bought a giant colorized diagram of the wiring of the car because I thought I was losing my mind. Now, all of the wiring in this car should be colorized. This shouldn't be this hard. But the problem is the previous owners left some of this wire in here factory and then had a whole bunch of purple wire and gray wire. And to add to the confusion, the purple wire says right rear on all of it. So they cut it off of like an easy wiring harness or something and then just reused it here. Now this purple wire in particular that I've pulled out here actually goes to the blue wire, which is what your turn signal should be getting power from. These two gray wires actually are going to different parts of the hazard wiring. So in this case, this one goes to white with a red stripe. That's essentially the output from the blinker module for the hazards. These two, red with a white stripe and blue, are basically crisscrossing wires that would have been before the blinker module. Now, I don't need these probably. I can probably get rid of these, cap these off, and delete them. This one I'm going to have to repurpose because what I'm going to need to do is convert all of the switched outputs from being positive, being sent to the lights through a blinker module, to grounds to be used as a trigger for the PMU. So instead, what will happen is I'll sever the connection to the lights directly. I will collect all those. I will send these to good grounds. And then when you do something like popping the hazard switch here, that will ground out on the output, which will go to the PMU. And the PMU will see that that circuit is now grounded and triggered. And then instead, its output will send power to the lights that will basically serve as like a relay slash fuse for each of the light circuits. So now instead of like this old car would have had happen where if one shorted out and had a major problem, all the lights just quit working. In this case, you can just lose just the left front, right rear, whatever, and not lose the rest of your lighting. Now, now that I've torn the dash all apart, I've also found that I can get to this orange wire, which is actually for the windshield wipers. So I didn't realize factory in this car, the power for the windshield wipers doesn't really go through a fuse. It just kinda does its own thing like going through the other circuits. So all the power for the wipers comes down this orange wire from what I can tell, and then is sent out from the switch on this combination of wires to go down to the motor to trigger different things. Now, if I just hijack this orange wire, if this is the input and I just cut this wire, I should be able to just send this back to the PMU and let the PMU control the wipers power supply without actually controlling the wipers. So I'll let everything else function the way it should. The PMU will just serve as a circuit breaker fuse slash relay for the wiper assembly. So at least it doesn't burn itself up and cause major problems down the road. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into this and see how far I get before I run into some other big snag. Okay, dash is back in the car. Center is all put back together. I've cleaned up all of my random junk that was everywhere and all of the systems work. In the spirit of trying to keep this video from being way too long, I'm going to go ahead and gloss over most of the details of the wiring. Basically, I replaced everything that had other connectors with Deutsch connectors to get connected back into my intermediary harnesses. I split apart factory systems so that I could gain control of them, take over my lighting, my blinkers, get control of the dash lights, get control of the windshield wiper power, all of that kind of stuff. Now, in phase two, I'll go ahead and take over my radiator fan and some of the other things, but I just didn't want to have to pull apart those harnesses in the engine bay right now, given I already did half the whole engine bay anyway. Now, when you're dealing with these wiring, the wiring in my car won't be exactly like anyone else's simply because the previous owners hack and slashed everything and finding out that there basically weren't any fuses in the harness is terrifying. So hopefully your harness is more stock and you'll have a basic fuse block there which will make it even easier to hijack because you know where the power is coming out of the fuse block. Now I did do some really interesting things with my blinkers to make them work here and to delete the blinker modules that would have been under the dash. I also had to do some advanced features for pairing off some connections. So let's go ahead and get into the software and look at some of the advanced features I just discovered. So in order to get into the software, you need a CAN bus adapter to USB. Now I have my laptop here with this adapter on it. 
I've tried other just USB to comms and serial adapters and they don't work. They actually have to go to CAN protocol. I don't know if there's anyone else out there selling these that are more cost effective because everything listed online that I saw was much more expensive, but you do need one of these. So if you can buy it during their sales items when they have the bundle where you get a free one with your purchase, go that route. Otherwise you need to spring a little extra money to get one of these. Now I just have it hooked to a super long USB cable that I use also for programming my ECU and everything on the 240Z. And I added in, as you saw, a serial extension that is the comms port or the CAN port for the PMU. Now when I connect this up, that allows me to manage and configure the PMU. That just needs to be a basic serial connection. You can get those on Amazon for a few bucks. You can get a package of them for 10 bucks. I chose to get a slightly more expensive one that didn't require soldering. The soldering head caused me some problems on the other car, so I wanted to make sure I had one I could fix in the field. And so this version lets you use just a small flat blade screwdriver to clamp down wires in there. So if I ever have problems, break a wire or whatever, I can use the end of a knife or a small screwdriver to replace that wiring without a problem and get connected back up. So let's go ahead, log into the software and see where we're starting. So once you're connected to the PMU, you can launch your software and it will end up starting at this connecting screen. Now you have the option here to start a new project from scratch, fill it all out and then upload it to the PMU when you give it power and connect later, or you can just auto connect directly to the PMU and build everything in the PMU directly. Now that's what I usually do just so I can hear each thing turn on and make sure I'm connected to the right outputs. What I'm expecting to have happen happens. So as soon as I turn on my key, that provides power to the system and syncs it up. Now on the right, you can see basically the health and conditions of the system. On the left, you can see all of the triggers and inputs and things that I've built as well as the outputs for power. Now I have a lot of these things here because I have a lot of accessories and things. I use pretty much all of my outputs and I actually had to go back and rework my outputs several times. Most of it was because of working with the blinker system. So now I have reworked the blinker system to use ground to trigger it. And as you can see here, you can have a left and a right blinker and they are sitting at basically five volts. I've said that they're going to be a grounded trigger, just like the trinary trigger. So it's sending a current there waiting to be grounded to tell it to turn on essentially. That way the switches don't carry a huge heavy load because they're not running everything that would be on the other side of it. They're not running all the lights, they're not running the HVAC, whatever switch it happens to be, not all of it's passing through. Especially the case in the hazard switch because it would be running all of the lights through it. So if you had a lot of load from lighting, that would be a problem. Now, what I did is I had to break this all out really interestingly because of the fact that my hazards were run and my hazards and blinkers both had their blinking modules before the switch. So what I ended up doing is I came in here and I wanted this to control the blinking and this has a blinker module function. So whenever you add an output or an input or something, you have them all in this add list here. Now, if you go to the blinkers module, I can't do it right now because it's already here. So I'll just go open the one I've got. You have to tell it what it's going to be blinking to and how it knows it's being turned on. The problem I ran into is that my brake lights also need to go there. So I started out by making an output for my left and right brake. And then because if those come on, the lights on constantly and I don't have a different stage bulb for the blinker, you wouldn't be able to tell it was trying to blink. So what I did is on these outputs, I said if the brake trigger is on and not the corresponding turn signal. So if it's the left brake light, don't turn on if the left turn signal is on. If it's the right brake light, don't turn on if the right turn signal is on. Once I did that, I was able to come back in here and build my left and right blinker and set them up with multiple outputs. So I have double pins. I have 04 and 013 attached to this particular one. Now this particular one, the left blinker here, this is the combination so that I can have the combined left back tail light, my driver tail light, and my left marker light in the front blink. 
Now, in order to do that, you will run into a limitation that isn't really documented anywhere, that you have to use the same amperage for both circuits. And that kind of makes sense, and kind of doesn't at the same time. Because the software could easily have a 25 and a 15 paired together, and then just limit you right here to maximum current, 15 amps. That's what I was going to do anyway. But now I have to consume two of the same, and if I don't have all the same available, I have to basically try to like move everything around, which is what I did to free up four 25 amps to use for these, just because I already had a couple 25s and a couple 15s, and it was easier to free those up. They're way overkill for what these lights should need. Now, once you set this up, you basically tell it what the current expectation is and everything like you would on any power output, and then you tell it how they're turned on. Left blinker is turned on by my input called left blinker. It's an active low because it's grounding now when you turn it on. Same thing with right blinker and same thing with brake trigger, except for brake trigger is active high. I'm still passing 12 volts through that, so when it sees that spike, it knows to turn on the brake lights. Now, that is all put into here, and because the way the hazards work on this car, in theory, the hazards are already going to turn on both the left and the right at the same time because that happens after the switch where I've grabbed everything. And that is the case. If I delete that hazards identifier out of here and I turn on my hazards, down here you can see that the left and right blinkers came on. They are one. But you see over here only the right blinker is blinking. The front right and the rear right are blinking and that's obviously not right what I learned here and that isn't really said anywhere is that you can only have one of these occur and it seems to be whichever one's the last one to happen so what I had to do because I didn't actually have a real input for hazards because I don't need it it already is theoretically happening it's just not being used properly is I came over here and created a hazards function so this is literally just a logic statement. It says, if left blinker and right blinker are true, this function is true. Then once I have that, I can come into my blinkers and pretend that that's an input. And I can say, hey, if these things are true, go to my hazards function and use its logic. Now that I have that logic in here, if I turn on my blinkers, both switches are one again, but now all four are blinking properly. That is a lot nicer than it would have been if I would have had to go find another input and build it into my harness. Now, that's a pretty advanced one. That was one that I didn't know about. I didn't know how to use these functions inside as inputs, but that gives you a lot of power because you can basically build functions for all sorts of combined systems and just have them work as if they're an analog or can input. So that makes life a lot easier. Now, obviously, within here, you can see that the system's blinking right now. And if I come in here, I can change how fast it blinks right here. And this is pretty cool. If you have a preference on how fast your system should blink, you can just change it on the fly. You could even have it do it different speeds for different things. You could have it blink faster if windshield wipers are on or blink slower if windshield wipers are on or do something else by just checking your other inputs with these functions it's pretty darn cool now if i were to come in here and let's put this back to the way it was just so that uh i don't forget because i actually like it blinking a little bit faster if i was coming to here get all this done now you have to be writing all this down on sheets of paper and keeping track and and I've got all my labels on my wires, so I know what my wires are, but in the back of the pins, it's hard to remember which one goes to what pin. The nice part about the software, and something I didn't get to show on the 240Z, is that it will generate a pin out for you. This is an HTML document you can save as a PDF or whatever that tells you every pin on the connector what it's named, what it's connected to, and what its configuration is, how many amps it's allowed to have, what the inrush is, everything. Same thing with inputs. This is really nice. When you're all done, you just print this sucker out and stick it in your glove box, and you have a clear identifier of everything set up on the unit, what version of firmware it's at, what client was used to do it, everything that was done when you saved this. So if you ever need to check out with tech support, you can just send them this. This will show them a lot of what you need. And if you want, you can send them the whole config file because this config file that is uploaded to your PMU 
can just be saved as a project. And so in this case, I have saved all mine under the name of which PMU it is, and then the initial configurations. So I can restore a configuration if something goes wrong, or if this PMU dies, I can buy a brand new PMU, upload that configuration, and hook it to this harness, and everything's done, everything just works. So that is a much faster solution than I would have with some of the old analog systems if something burned up. If I burned up a fuse block or had some major problem, I would have to rewire, rebuild the fuse block and possibly somewhere else in the system, given that this thing didn't really have fuses before. In this case, if that thing gets nuked, I just figure out what's wrong, fix it, and then just put a new one on there and give it its configuration, and I'm back running. So this is really cool. Now, I think this is already going to be kind of a long video for what I was shooting for, but if you have any questions about any of this, anything about the...